When we talked last time about the similarities and differences, I want those side lights to go off. There we go. Uh, between, hey, how come nobody said to me that that's not? Sorry about that, you guys. You, you can speak up. <laughs> that is loud. <laughs> just think, oh, today we'll just crane our necks more than 90 degrees. All right, now hopefully that will come on. Warming up, six seconds remaining. All right. Uh, last time when we were talking about Koroi and we were talking about the similarities and the differences, we did not mention the most salient difference. The most salient difference is not, in my opinion, that the Egyptian guys have clothes on and the Greek guys are nude, although that is both obvious and significant. The most salient difference is this. The Egyptian guys are somebody specific. The Greek guys are not. When we talk about influence and borrowing and where did you get your ideas from, it's a very layered question. Where do you draw the line between inspiration and copying? What do you call something that looks and is made so similarly to something else? Do you say that it's a copy? And if you say that it's inspired, what is the part that's original? In other words, what's Greek about the Koros? If the material is the same as the Egyptian statue, the pose is the same, the entire way that it's manufactured is the same, the material is the same, the technique is the same, if all of those things are the same, why do we call this Greek and this Egyptian? It can't be just because this fella doesn't got any clothes on. That is not significant enough. The Greeks got the know-how and the idea for this, but they did not copy Egyptian statues. They took the knowledge and they made something that catered to their way of thinking and expressed what was important to them not to the Egyptians. So what was important to the Egyptians was to depict somebody specific. But what was important to the Greeks was to depict an ideal. And that's the most important difference between these two. That's what makes the Koros Greek and not a Greekized Egyptian standing male statue. Borrowing is a term that masks the actual idea of what's going on. In the seventh century, when Greeks were down in Egypt being awe-inspired by large standing stone architecture and sculpture and learning how to, uh, how to concoct such things, they were also in increasingly becoming aware of the political dominion and the artistic creations of those enemies of the Egyptians against which some Greeks had been hired as mercenaries to help fight the Neo-Assyrians. In the Neo-Assyrian Empire, small, portable, luxury objects, artistic creations, especially ivories, but also little metalwork and, and wood carving, traveled. And those objects traveled to places where Greeks could pick them up. So you're looking here on the screen at three objects from uh, the Assyrian capitals of Nineveh and Nimrud, uh, little bronze lion weights, little um, ivory lion um, finials. They were, they were uh, attached to uh, a piece of furniture. And a little ivory inlay, a very, very famous ivory inlay, which sadly some anonymous person now has. It's one of the many of the ivories that was taken in the sack of the Baghdad Museum and not recovered. Um, 
Uh, and ivory that was an inlay to probably um, a piece of furniture, a chair or a bed or a table, and shows uh, a lion chomping on a youth, killing a youth. These kinds of small objects with their amazing um, scary animals and, and intricate designs could travel and did and impressed the Greeks. In addition to lions, which were a favored subject of the Assyrians, sphinxes um, of the sort that you see here, this one found at the um, Israelite capital of Samaria, and this one from uh, a site which is just underneath her, her body, Arslantash in um, eastern Turkey. These sphinxes, like this, this lion mauling the youth, were inlays for furniture. And they were exciting, they were exotic, they were beautiful, they were magical, and they were small and portable. So they, uh, they and objects like these would have traveled and been um, accessible to and admired by the Greeks. How do we know? Because in the 7th century, the Greeks start putting these exact images into their pictorial art. Now, they don't carve ivory, and they are not yet prolific enough or technically adept enough to cast bronze in forms this intricate. But the ideas and the pictures they find engaging. So here on the Analitas Amphora, which you've seen before, uh, the frieze that's at the top is clearly uh, inspired by sphinxes, such as the, the ivory inlaid sphinx from Ars Lentash that you see here. And uh, you can see that uh, the Greek artist has either not actually seen this exact sort of thing or um, isn't really inclined to uh, make something quite this coherent. So <laughs> I really love this. So that the head of the Sphinx is identical to the head of any of the people walking on the amphora. I mean, so, and the horse, I mean, the, the, the body of the Sphinx is not too dissimilar to, to a horse. And then this, this wing is weirdly um, just sort of slapped on. And that's the essence of a magical creature. Uh, this, the, 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 the proto-attic version of the Sphinx is not, is not only not equal to the sum of its parts, it's kind of less than the sum of its parts. It's like all the parts separate, you can really make them out. It's kind of funny. Um, and uh, here you uh, see another proto-attic vessel, a big crater, and this time, uh, the excitement of the new ideas has taken over so that they've, come up, they've, they've taken up the main freeze of, of the pot. Uh, now you have the obligatory chariot procession, which was so common, so popular, so, so valued on the, on the vessels of the geometric era just two generations earlier, um, now is uh, relegated to the upper part of the vessel. And here, front and center on the main body of the vessel, are... Uh, lions who, again, one cannot help but feel that this Greek artist has not seen a lion, <laughs> but likes the idea of a lion and especially um, is interested in the lion's big feet and big mouth <laughs> and perhaps her tail. Those animals, they have very, very large paws and they have very, very big jaws. And the Greek artist said, okay. <laughs> and, that, and that's what's <laughs> that what is what got drawn there, along with these adorable long curly Q tails. Now, in the seventh century, there were two cities above all that were starting to produce painted pottery in abundance. You've already noted that one of the things that Greeks like to do is paint pictures on pots. That was part of that long list that we came up with a couple weeks ago. They like to paint pictures on pots, and Greeks in towns all throughout the Greek world painted pictures on pots. We today are only going to look at the Greeks who lived in the cities of Athens and Corinth, but I don't want you to think that there weren't plenty of other people doing this. It's just that 
Uh, we're not going to go into the pan pots from Sparta and from Thebes and from East Greece and blah, blah, blah. Although Mr. Pedley in his book has um, some discussion of some of those, so you'll be able to catch up. Uh, when you make a pot, uh, you are dependent on the kind of clay you have. The kind of clay readily available in Corinth was a pale, is a pale, light color. And the kind of clay readily available in Athens, where there is more iron in the soil, is redder. So the background of an attic pot, the actual clay color is kind of red. The background of a Corinthian vessel is kind of white. In the 7th century, when the Athenian potters were decorating their pots simply by uh, painting directly on the pot in a kind of silhouette style, Corinthian potters were doing something just slightly more advanced. In addition to painting on the pot itself, in this case a cup, they were incising decoration incising details. So the lion on this Proto-Corinthian cup here, all the details of his face and his eyes and his ear are incised with a fine point in outline. And here on this little cup, uh, you see a rider on a horse, a, a bareback, and the horse's mane and haunches and eyes and bridle, and all of the details are incised. The addition of incision meant that the Corinthian potters could produce pictures with clearer detail, and they did. They also favored, unlike the attic potters, for the pots that they chose to decorate, they favored little vessels, whereas the attic potters like big, big vessels. So you've got this gigantic crater here, um, which is proto-attic. The kind of pottery that we get from Athens in the 7th century, uh, archaeologists call proto-attic, and the kind that we get from Corinth is called proto-Corinthian. And that's because in the 6th century, uh, the pottery is called attic and Corinthian. And this is leading up to it, and so that's what people call it. And uh, whatever, now you know. Um, so, so 7th century Attic vessels, very large, 7th century Corinthian vessels, very small, and in both cases, inspired by Eastern models, although in the Corinthian case, more, more specifically. So here is a, a Phoenician bronze cup, and you can see that the shape of the cup is identical to the shape of the Proto-Corinthian cup um, here. Uh, so that's copied. And in addition, the actual decoration is copied. It's probably pretty hard to see uh, what I just put this circle around, but it's a, it's a rider riding bareback on a horse, identical to this scene. And um, up here, uh, a lion face uh, processing along, similar to the lion, in a very, who's a very dignified lion. The Proto-Corinthian lion is a, is a dignified lion as opposed to that. The Proto-Attic lion, which looks like a cross between a lion and a black lab or something. <laughs> looks like a very friendly lion. <laughs> um, so, so the ideas here are, are by the Proto-Corinthian artists, um, taken wholesale. These Proto-Corinthian vessels are really wonderful for a couple of reasons. The, the decorations painted on them, the scenes that are painted on them, are very, very fine and intricate. And the vessels themselves are really tiny. It's kind of unbelievable. This is actually miniaturist art. It's miniaturist painting. So this cup, this little cup that you've been looking at here, is about this big. It's a tiny thing. And this jug is only this big. So they are, they are really compact. And the scenes on them, so the scene, for example, here is less than a centimeter high. And if you were looking at this in the British Museum, which is where you need to go to see it, uh, you would need to peer down into the case to really catch the details. Um, because uh, they, they are very tiny and fine. And you can see uh, that in some cases, the pots have been decorated uh, with just with 
friezes of animals, the sorts of great animals that the Proto-Corinthian artists would have uh, seen in, from Near Eastern art, like these, uh, these processing lions here. Um, and then in some cases, like here, actual scenes, like uh, two, two warriors fighting. And you see that these are vessels for fine dining. Uh, cups for drinking wine out of, jugs for, for pouring wine. So this is the sort of fancy stuff that you would set at, at the table. The most popular Proto-Corinthian vessels were perfume bottles. These two perfume bottles are three inches high. So obviously here, highly, highly magnified. Just, just crazy small. They're so small and perfect and adorable. And even the little filler decoration is perfect and adorable on Proto-Corinthian pottery. It's just wonderful. So um, this cute little thing here is called a dot rosette because instead of making a rosette where, you know, all fourth grade girls dot their eyes with like a daisy or something like that, um, this, this rosette is made of individually placed little dots. And you have to imagine the painter kind of licking the end of his paintbrush and then making a little dot, making another little dot, or dipping the stick into the ink because that's how tiny and refined these things are. This Proto-Corinthian pottery was so beautiful and wonderful that people all over the Greek world wanted it. And it is found at colonies and also places that are not Greek colonies throughout the Mediterranean. And that is very, very handy. And here's why. There were a whole series of Greek colonies that were especially established in what's sometimes called in Greek archaeology classes <laughs> West Greece, which is actually Italy, <laughs> Italy and Sicily. And you see the, the southern area, the, the boot and the heel of um, Italy and, and uh, our southeast, eastern Sicily. And here's the thing. This is very cool. The Greek historian... Uh, Thucydides, in the 5th century BCE, wrote uh, in a history of Greece when various Greek colonies were founded. He dated them according to the Olympiads. You all remember that the Olympics began in 776 BCE, and the Greeks dated everything according to the Olympiads once, once, the, Olympiads, once the Olympics started. So every four years we get, a different, we get a different Olympiad, and we know the precise date of each one. And Thucydides tells us exactly when, according to the Olympiads, the various colonies were founded. In the cemeteries of these colonies, archaeologists have recovered Proto-Corinthian pottery, tons of it. People were buried with these cute little perfume flasks and these cute little cups. And because we know the order in which the colonies were founded, we can date very finely uh, all this Proto-Corinthian pottery. And it is the first category of find from essentially the archaic period, the Iron Age of Greece, that provides us with uh, something close to an absolute date um, just by its style. So, um, so th the Proto-Corinthian period, the Proto-Corinthian era, was uh, essentially the last half of the 7th century. BCE. And the pottery is generally decorative. That is, generally it just has, you know, lions prancing around or sphinxes or chase scenes. But sometimes the pictures tell a story. Now, there are two kinds of stories. There are story stories like myths and legends like the Iliad, the Odyssey, the story of Odysseus and the Cyclops, fairy tales, we might think of them, it, great legends, heroic sagas, the Greeks would think of them. And then there's life. Now we've started to see on Greek painted pots pictures of life. Actually, more specifically, pictures of funerals. So the rituals surrounding funerals. But those are pictures that 
if you stop for a minute to think about it, do something interesting, which is elevate an activity of regular humans to the sphere of art. It's worth commemorating. When that happens, your life, those activities, are ennobled. They are made worthy of recognition. Now, a funeral is a specific ritual, and it's a very crucial ritual in what modern sociologists call the life course. And we talked about these, these signposts of life, birth, marriage, death. Um, and in the geometric era, those were the categories of life activity that deserved some kind of pictorial representation. But beginning in the 7th century, Greeks start to paint pictures of other aspects of daily life. It doesn't have to be just um, the most important, most central points in time. Can, it, can be, it can be things that, just, that, that are more day-to-day -day activities. And this little vase, which is 10 inches high, so about this, um, called the Kiji vase because in 1881, it was found in an Etruscan tumulus on the property of Prince Mario Kiji. And today it resides in the Villa Giulia in Rome, where um, it's got a very nice display case, and you can walk all the way around it and get right up close to it, which is good because it's so tiny, and each of the friezes on it is, is, is very, very tiny. This little vase, uh, which this little jug, which would have been used at a dinner party to pour wine, has uh, a series of really interesting scenes on it, friezes, we would call them, F-R-I-E-Z-E, -E, not E-E. -E. Um, so in the lowest frieze, the one down here at the bottom, are uh, rabbits running from hunting dogs, and on the other side of the vase, you can't um, see, obviously, are youths that are chasing, very young boys actually, who are chasing the, um, the rabbit. They're looking to catch the rabbit. They don't have weapons. They're very young, these boys. They don't have any weapons, and they don't even have any traps. Um, they just got a dog and their own young, strong legs, and, they're, and so it's just uh, practically a game. In the second freeze, uh, there is, there are two scenes um, running around the vase. First, a procession of young boys on horseback. They are riding bareback, and each of these young men is accompanied by a second horse. So there are two horses in tandem in the pair. And because the artists have um, not only have this refined incision, but now they've added another, another feature of the, of, uh, in their technical arsenal. In addition to painting and then incising, the next thing they do is put more color. They add different colors. So they add white, they add um, a sort of uh, redder color. So incision and added color um, are... are inserted into the vase painter's arsenal, allowing lots of additional detail in the story to come out. So, so these young fellows uh, are probably squires. That is, they are bringing the, they are riding a horse and they are bringing an additional horse, possibly for the ewes that uh, are on the other side of this middle scene. And that's the scene that you see here. The other side of the middle scene is separated from the procession by a sphinx who's looking straight out. You might just be able to make her out, the sphinx. She has her head turned in a completely impractical 90 degree way that is very adorable in vase painting, although very difficult in real life. And what that does is allow her to have her body completely in profile, but her head looking straight out at you. Very nice trick. She must practice yoga. 
<laughs> and that sphinx separates the procession of young, uh, young squires from this scene, which you see here uh, now in detail. And this is obviously um, a lion hunt. And there are three youths that are, are after the lion. And it's hard not to recollect this little ivory, which per this individual one, nobody in Greece could have seen since it was found in Nimrud in Kurdistan, Iraq. But um, something similar to it likely was. And uh, the lion uh, is getting the best of this young fellow, but the other three youths, armed with spears, uh, are getting the best of the lion. And then uh, there's a top freeze. And the top freeze shows two sides um, arranged for fighting. And they, one side is, is uh, marched along by a flute player, as uh, was customary in um, Greek warfare. So for the most part, scholars for uh, over 100 years since this little vase was found um, have thought that this is just an interesting series of scenes. But recently, uh, Jeff Hurwitt, a guy who teaches um, at Reed College in Oregon and uh, is a specialist in early Greek art, um, has written a very, very cool article called Reading the Kiji Vase. I'm going to put this article on the website under additional reading for people who want to, um, to take a look. He argues, he has convinced me, and now I will tell you what he argues, because I think this is so cool, that this is a vase that is a parable designed to be read in two directions, vertically and horizontally. Hauntily. The vertical read goes like this. You have at the bottom boys engaged in one of those training games that young boys engage in, which is chasing and, and hunting. In the middle, you have youths, both uh, the squires and the hunters, and the hunters are graduated from the young, the young fellows that lack weapons in the lowest freeze, and now their game is something real and something dangerous instead of something small and easy to catch, something that has um, the potential to, to damage, as is well evoked in the lion um, attacking the one young boy. And then in the upper freeze, you have men off to war. In other words, you have what, what Jeff calls a paradigm of maleness. As youths grow and the enemy becomes more dangerous and more real, and the stakes become higher. And then around the middle band, he argues that the procession that is separated from the lion hunt by that sphinx is a cycle between real life and the exotic unreality of these Eastern, this Eastern imagery and these Eastern monsters, lions and sphinxes. There's not any evidence that actually there lions existed in Greece at this time. There haven't been any remains of lions found. So this is practically a mythical scene, but it's set in real life, closing the gap for the person looking at this between the great stories of the legendary heroes and events that anybody might be able to engage in. So, he's, he, so Jeff argues that this little vase is one of the first in what is a long and noble series of Greek artistic statements that don't just tell a story, but send a message. Which, in, in some ways, of course, all pictorial art is, but some is, some is more pointed than others. 
Proto-Corinthian, as a painted pottery style, ruled the Mediterranean for 50 years. That proto-Attic pottery that you saw is only found in Athens. It's not found anywhere else. There was no market for it. Proto-Corinthian is found across the Mediterranean, the Near East, as far west as Spain, as far east as Mesopotamia. And in its detailed, small perfection, it is very, very captivating. Uh, the story of what happens in the course of two generations to the uh, Proto-Corinthian pottery industry is a little bit sad. So this is what happens when you don't have any competition and you just feel like you don't really have to worry about uh, how you're doing. 25 years after uh, the Kiji vase in this Proto-Corinthian cup and jug, uh, we get early Corinthian. You can see that while you still have, you have all of the techniques. You have the color, you have the added color, you have the incision. Uh, you have the same sorts of scenes, in this case on this cup, lions and sphinxes alternating. Um, the lions have their heads fainted, faced frontally. But now the figures are a little bit more stretched out so that you don't have to paint quite as many of them. And the adorable dot rosette, it's one of the saddest sagas of Corinthian pictorial art, has um, turned into, uh, this is now a black, I mean, at least you have edges on this, right? Uh, but then for the interior, uh, it's just, the, the lines are incised out. Um, uh, so that was a cup, and, and here's a jug. And again, you can see uh, that the animals have gotten longer and less detailed. So here's this perfunctory tail um, on the lion. And here's his mane. Look at that. This is a slob. This person is so lazy. This is just a checkerboard incision for the mane instead of a uh, kind of refined pattern. Um, and similarly, the, uh, the neck on the, the sphinxes with joined heads here is just a series of incisions. And then uh, by the beginning of the 6th century, you get, for example, on these little perfume bottles, um, uh, a single figure that is bloated to encompass the entirety of the <laughs> diameter so that less figures need to be drawn. And the dot rosette has turned into what um, is actually called in the parlance, this is a technical term, a blob rosette. <laughs> These little things, that is just a blob with a couple little incision lines on it. <laughs> oh, it's so sad. Um, so while the Corinthian painters are getting sloppy, um, the Attic artists are picking up some ideas. Attica, of course, is just next door to Corinthia. And proto-Corinthian pottery is found in abundance in Athens. And the Attic potters throughout the 7th century were content to make vessels for domestic uses, funerals, weddings, uh, dinner parties, and many of the vessels on which they expended their painting efforts were very, very large, like the Eleusis Amphora that you see here. Like the Corinthian artists and like, like all Greeks, the Attic artists were interested in telling stories. They liked stories. Story, telling stories is one of those features that we know is part of Greek art, Greek culture. Um, so here on the Eleusis Amphora, is, for example, the story of uh, Odysseus and the Cyclops. And you see that while all these technical innovations on the part of the Proto-Corinthian artists, added color, incision are going on, the Attic artists are having none of it. There is still just paint on the, paint on the pot, silhouette style. Um, and you can see the difference in uh, the degree of fidelity for um, for the scene at hand. And you have to remember that these scenes, with uh, all their legible detail, are this high. You know, they're about an, an inch and a half high. But the Attic artists, they come around. By the early 6th century, they adopt 
all of the technical developments that the Proto-Corinthian artists have come up with, added color, incision, and this style of painting. Black on the surface of the pot, added color, and incision, that whole amalgam is called black figure. It's invented by the Corinthians. It is perfected by the Athenians. The Athenians take the same ideas that have animated the Proto-Corinthian artists, but in their own way, they modify them. The first thing they do is make everything bigger because they like things big. So uh, they invent, for example, this kind of party punch bowl on a stand that's called a dinos. And these two dinoi on their stands would have been the centerpiece on, uh, in an elaborate dinner party. And they adopt for a while the Corinthian habit of these parading animal friezes. Uh, but they add something that, with the exception of the Kiji vase, is basically absent from Corinthian art. They add a story. Yeah, question. <coughs> um, what, what are the traits, again, that, uh, that the profile for the black figure? Black paint on the surface of the pot, added color, incision. Um, so you... You might have been, you, you, you might have admired those Proto-Corinthian pots that were up here on the screen. They are very adorable. They are very cute. They are also kind of boring. I mean, there's just a limit to how many times you can see a bunch of lions and sphinxes parading around the middle of a pot. Uh, and so in addition to the um, Proto-Corinthian artists losing the market edge in part because they got very sloppy with their technique. It's not improbable that they also started to lose market share because people were bored by the pots and they wanted something more interesting. So the Attic Potters pick up uh, the animal friezes and you can see sphinxes and lions um, and, and floral motifs on these uh, giant dinoi and stands. Um, here, but you also can see stories. So here, for example, on the Gorgon Painter's Dinos, up here, Perseus and Medusa, one of those famous stories that, that was on the um, middle of the Eleusis Amphora. Uh, there are the, um, this is actually a hilarious rendition. Uh, here's Perseus, hot-footing it away. You can see him running in that cute little um, symbol that Attic Black Figure artists use for running, which is sort of like this. <laughs> So there's per there he goes, woo! And here's Gorgon Sister 1 and Gorgon Sister 2. And oh no, Gorgon Sister 3. <laughs> so that must be Medusa, who has just lost her head. Yeah. How can we tell it's Perseus? Because that's the guy who kills, who slices off the head of the Gorgon. So it has to be Perseus. Um, yeah, it has to be Perseus because he's the only person who who effected this. That, that's his story. He's the hero of that story. He and no other. Um, we call this figure the Gorgon Painter because we don't know his name. For the most part, we don't know the names of Attic painters. This is his what's called name vase, meaning the style of this painter was identified on the basis of this vase because of its story on the top here. I mean, you, the, the name comes from the Gorgon frieze, the Gorgon subject. Um, and then other vases have been identified as by the same artist and assigned to him. This Dinos and stand is, uh, as you can see, by somebody that we have a name for. This is the first artist to sign his name in Greek art. His name is Sophilos. And he wrote vertically next to a column on this dinos, Sophilos Medgrafsen, Sophilos painted me. There are two kinds of signatures by artists on Greek pots. Signatures that say that the artist painted me, Medgrafsen, 
from grapheo, to write, to draw. And somebody made me, mepoyasin. Those, those signatures, the, the poyao signatures, the made me signatures, are for the potter. Today, when we look at the pots, we focus on the pictures. The pictures are great. We have five times as many signatures of potters as we do of painters, suggesting that to the Greeks, or at least to the people who worked in the pottery industry, it was the potting that was the most impressive thing and that people wanted to get credit for. And it's true that it's not so simple to make these very, very large, perfectly finished, very, very even pots. But the fact that we have individual signatures tells us something very interesting. We already noted that one of the features of Greek culture is that the individual is important. And so far, the individuals that have been important are elite individuals, people with enough money to dedicate something, like Nicandri and Nicandri's family, or Manticloss, who, who gave the Manticloss what is called the Manticloss Apollo. We looked at both of those a couple weeks ago. Sophilos is not a member of the elite. He's a member of the working class. He's not even the potter. He's just the guy who does the painting. He's a craftsman. And he is announcing his prowess. The scene on the Dinos of Sophilos that you were just looking at here is one of the most famous stories in Greek myth and a story that the Greeks found so central to their concept of how the world was originally structured and balanced that it and its offshoots are a very prominent feature in Greek art. Uh, the story, which is only told on the upper frieze of the Dinos here, because the, low, the, the central body and the lower body are just more of these Eastern animal processions. But this frieze at the top here, that would have been at eye level for you if you were one of the people reclining on a couch in the banquet room. You would have been about at the level of this table, and the Dinos would have been here in the middle of the floor, and when you looked over, your eye would have been taken by this scene, which we know unequivocally what the subject is because the figures are labeled. Sophilos wanted you to know what this story was. What's the story? It's the wedding of the hero Peleus, P-E-L-E-U-S, labeled right here, and Thetis, a sea nymph. A wedding to which all the Olympian gods came. A wedding sanctioned by the gods between a mortal and an immortal. As one might say in another context, those were the days. And that's how the Greeks felt about it. Those were the days. Those were the days when the gods and men consorted among each other. Here's proof. We've got the picture. You see all the gods labeled coming to present gifts to Peleus. We have to imagine Thetis is inside the house. Um, which is arranged, uh, you see it's got two columns and a uh, sort of paneled frieze uh, across the top, and the columns even have Doric entablature, like contemporary temples. And there is the inscription of Sophilos inserted in between the two columns right there. Um, so you see all, all of the deities, including the two most important in the story for the, uh, for what comes next in the story. The first uh, most important one is Dionysus, set off here, labeled and carrying uh, some vegetation that is appropriate for his position as the god of the wine, um, because Dionysus was the character in the story 
who brought as a gift, but it's not depicted here on this, on this vase, to Peleus a golden amphora. And that was the amphora in which the son of Peleus, Achilles, was to have his ashes laid when he died. And the second most important character is uh, Chiron, the centaur, who is here. He is bringing an ash branch, Chiron, a centaur. Centaurs were uh, wild guys. They lived out in the woods. The ash branch that Chiron brings was fashioned into a spear, a spear that honored one of the exploits of Peleus, which was his killing of a, of a boar, the Caledonian boar, and which was given to his son, Achilles, and is the spear that was so heavy that only Achilles could lift it, and was the cause of his doom, Achilles that is, not Peleus, as we'll hear about in a moment. So the story of the wedding of Peleus and Thetis is a fraught, is a tale that is triumphant and hopeful, but also very fraught. Because embedded in the story, and everybody would have known this, that's the beauty of a legend. It's not just this event. Like any famous story that's told in any culture, when you hear the story, you enshrine it inside an aura of all the other pieces that are linked to it. And the story of Peleus and Thetis is the story behind the pivotal event in Greek history, which is the Trojan War. So it's a story that both enshrines an extremely noble man, but also embeds within the story future destruction. It is the climactic moment in Greek history because it is the climactic event of the relationship between gods and men, and it is the beginning of the end when that relationship is irrevocably severed. That story, the story of the wedding of Peleus and Thetis, is told again and in, in an even more detailed uh, way on this phase. The Francois vase, an Attaplac figure crater, signed by both the potter and the painter. The potter is Ergotimos and the painter is Clytius. And it's not only signed by them, but it has a ridiculous number of figures and a ridiculous number of inscriptions. It has 270 figures and 121 inscriptions. Everything on this pot is labeled, even inanimate objects. Trees are labeled, tables are labeled, altars are labeled, everything is labeled. It's crazy. There has to be a reason, and one of the reasons must have been that there was a point to the stories as a whole that were told on this pot and uh, the artist, Clytius, wanted the point to be uh, made very clear. I've given you a handout of the Francois vase. I'm going to quickly sum up, uh, as quickly as I possibly can, um, sum up the story of this. You can refer to your handout, so that's, that hopefully you don't have to write down every detail because you because you have got it here. And before I go further, let me say that about this pot too, there is um, a fantastic detailed article called Stasichorus, who is a Greek lyric poet, and the Francoises, which I am also going to put on the website under additional reading. So uh, if you love the Francoises, and who doesn't love the Francoises, then um, you will be able to read even more about it. Well, what's the story? The story on the middle, so you're looking at side A. There's two sides, side A and side B. Um, around the middle of uh, side A, and in fact going all the way around, this is the only frieze that goes all the way around on both sides, is the wedding of Peleus and Thetis. This time, 
Clytius has done something very interesting. He has, in the group of people who are coming to bring uh, gifts to Peleus, who again is standing in front of his house just as he was on the Dinos by Sophilos. Um, there's Dionysus, and you can see that this time Dionysus has the pot. He has the amphora. Now, you have to assume that this is the amphora, the golden amphora. Why? Because Dionysus is bending under the weight of this thing. He, he, even though he's a god, he's having a little bit of trouble holding it directly upright. So it must be very uh, big and, and heavy. Uh, the story of the wedding of Peleus and Thetis has a backstory and a series of successions, and altogether provides a commentary in a much, much richer way than the Kiji vase of what it meant to be a hero. Essentially, meaning what it meant to be a man, to be a good man. No, to be a great man, according to the Greeks. We have two main characters, Peleus and his son, Achilles. Peleus was a hero by virtue of the excellence of his character, which is embedded in that Greek term, arete. And the story that epitomizes the excellence of the character of Peleus is the Caledonian boar hunt. And that's the top frieze on the Francoises. You see the boar larger than life, one man here below him crushed. And here is Peleus along with the, the hero Meleager in the foreground about to dispatch the boar. After the boar who had been ravaging the countryside of Caledon, and so all of the Greek heroes were called in by the king of Caledon to come and help, and all the heroes responded because when there is a disaster or a problem, that's what heroes do. They respond. They come to help. So Peleus comes to help. And so valiant was he fighting in the forefront of all of the heroes that the queen of Caledon importuned him after the hunt. But he said no because she was married and that would not be right. And she then spread a lot of dirty stories about him, but the gods were watching. And the gods saw that Peleus had acted honorably and upright, and they said to him, Peleus, because of your tremendous strength and excellence of character, we will bestow upon you a gift. And that gift is to be wed to an immortal. And that is how Peleus became the husband of Thetis. The offspring of their union was Achilles. Achilles is a hero for a new age. Peleus was an old-fashioned hero, upright, strong, kind of strong, silent type. Sort of, I don't know, Gregory Peck. <laughs> Achilles, more like Brad Pitt. <laughs> Achilles has tremendous, tremendous strength. Epitomized in this scene immediately below the um, main frieze on the Francois vase, this is a scene from the very beginning of the Trojan War, because Trojan War, which is set off by an event that happens at the marriage of Peleus and Thetis, it's at the marriage of Peleus and Thetis that the nasty goddess Strife, who had not been invited, comes, throws out the golden apple, which is inscribed to the fairest, there's a little tussle between the three big goddesses, Athena, Hera, and Aphrodite. Aphrodite bribes Paris, who is to be the judge of the contest, with the love of the fairest woman in the world. If he picks her to be the fairest deity, you wouldn't think that a deity would need to bribe a mortal. But those were the days, as we keep saying, when they were all hung up together, mortals and immortals. And, of course, the fairest woman in the world was Helen, who then... Um, is made to fall in love with Paris, and then they, uh, Paris takes her back home to Troy, and that's what starts the Trojan War. There was a um, um, prophecy 
that Troy would not fall if the son of the king, whose name was Troilus, lived to his 20th birthday. When he was 19 years old, he left the walls of the city to go outside for water. Achilles was waiting in ambush. Troilus saw Achilles, got on his horse, and sped away. And Achilles, so fleet of foot that he could overtake a striding horse, is hot on his tail. So the great physical strength and prowess of Achilles is here revealed. Troilus runs to an altar of the god Apollo. And Achilles hunts him down and kills him. Now this, of course, is the grossest impiety. But it is also evidence of a kind of rage of determination that separates Achilles from his sort of milk toasty dad, Peleus, and recommends him as a hero for this new age, this age where the gods and the mortals don't necessarily consort with each other all the time, and mortals don't necessarily need to lay down in front of the gods every time either. Above the wedding of Peleus and Thetis is a scene that shows the best of Achilles, the complete opposite. What is the best of Achilles? Ten years after the fatal ambush of Troilus, the war is dragging on. One of the reasons that the war is dragging on is that Achilles has been sulking in his tent for quite a while. He's PO'd. And so there's no great warrior to fight against the Trojans. The great friend and lover, probably, of Achilles, Patroclus, finally, in desperation, dons the armor of Achilles and takes the spear, the ash spear, which was fashioned out of the branch that Charon brought to the wedding. And he goes out to meet Hector in battle. But the spear is too heavy for him. Only Achilles can handle the spear. And so Patroclus is killed. And in honor of Patroclus, Achilles mounts a splendid series of funeral games, which we heard about in Iliad 23. And that ga those games are, is what are, is depicted on the frieze here. And you see tripod cauldrons um, as the prizes and the horses running and the tremendous loyalty of uh, Achilles to his uh, to his companion is on display here. And then eventually um, Achilles in sorrow after his after Patroclus is killed has to decide what to do and he has a choice. A choice that is given to him straightforwardly by his mother Thetis. You can leave Troy. I will take you away. I will transport you home. You will marry, have children, grow old, and have a full life as a mortal. Or you can stay and die on the field and live forever in song. And Achilles chooses the second. He knows that that's his choice. He has both options. And here on the handles of the vase, Ajax, the second most glorious of the heroes of the Greeks, is carrying the body of Achilles off the field. Side B of the Francois vase, I will not go through all of the details. If you want more details, you can read the article. I'll just um, show you a detail of the top, of the very top frieze. 
The wedding of Peleus and Thetis continues around both sides, but the rest of the friezes are different. The very uppermost frieze, um, the, the, all the rest of the friezes on side B are different sorts of marriages. So the overriding theme of the vase is marriage and its logical outgrowth, which is children, and then what, comes, uh, what may come after. Um, and the uppermost frieze has my all-time favorite little detail of all the many wonderful details on the Francois vase. This is um, uh, Theseus and Ariadne returning home from Crete. Theseus is another Greek hero. He has killed the Minotaur, um, re, uh, freed Ariadne, uh, along with the other Athenian uh, men and women youths that have been sent periodically to... Uh, to be Minotaur fodder in the in the tale, so he's so he's a great hero, and so they're they're all saved, and they sail away from Crete, and they land on the island of Delos, and they cannot believe that they've been saved. They are so excited, so they're <laughs> exulting. Um, as this guy is just completely overjoyed, or this guy who is my all-time favorite, who's just like, ah, land, sure, I'm home, I'm free. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> just, <laughs> his, his body is totally outstretched. <laughs> like, <laughs> even his beard is outstretched. <laughs> oh, I love adequate figure. <laughs> it's so great. Um, all right. Uh, attic black figure was uh, the technique that took over the potting uh, industry of Athens throughout the 6th century BCE. And it presents to us for the first time in the ancient world a view of everything that the Athenians thought was important, was interesting, was funny, Things that were serious, things that were casual, scenes of daily life, scenes of myth, scenes of legend. Every kind of subject that you can imagine would be worth representing artists of the Potter's Quarter of Athens represented in black figure in the 6th century BCE. So uh, here is a very adorable uh, story that was a key story in uh, Athenian mythology. And we're going to meet this story again um, in a couple of weeks when we get to the Parthenon. So this is, a, this is a preview. This is the story of the birth of Athena. You know the story. Uh, Zeus had a headache, very bad headache, so bad nothing could make it better, called for Hephaestus, the smithy god, to come and relieve him of his headache. Hephaestus uh, took his handy axe and cleaved the head of Zeus in two. That's what you can do if you're Zeus. We don't recommend this for home use. And out popped the goddess Athena, full grown and fully armed. No wonder Zeus had a headache. And here on this little on this little Pyxis, um, which is a, a, a little a little stand, uh, are are all the main characters. Zeus seated. Um, Hera and Athena. Here's Poseidon with his trident. You know, this is the, this is what we were talking about with with the Kuroi. Uh, one of the things that painting does in this period that sculpture doesn't do very well is identify people because in painting you can give them all their attributes, and that's what allows you to recognize them. So there's no difference uh, in the way that Poseidon looks and Zeus. If they didn't have their attributes, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. This is what makes this figure Poseidon. This is, makes this um, figure Zeus. Anyway, here's Athena. She's, she's a little tiny because the sea painter here didn't quite really think of exactly how he was going to fit Athena in. So um, we'll see a much better resolution of this, this stylistic problem on the east pediment of the Parthenon. Um, but here we have Athena jammed up among under the lid. But she's got her spear, her helmet, and her little shield. Oh, she's all there. I was just wondering, what's uh, Zeus holding? What is Zeus holding? He's holding, um, it's uh, like a walking stick. And in the other, there's like somebody else's hand. On the left, yeah. 
Oh, that's his thunderbolt. That is the thunderbolt. Okay. That's the thunderbolt of Zeus. Yes, it looks like two upside down lilies. Uh, so maybe that's what confused you, but it is his thunderbolt. It's in flames. Uh, what's the little character underneath this tree? Yes, that's a good question. I don't know what that little character is. So <laughs> that's not a deity because it's, uh, he doesn't have any attributes. So he's not identified as a deity. Sometimes, I mean, I, I know in another vase that comes from around this time period, there are little things like that. Um, there, it's, a, it's a very famous um, cup with a scene in the stables of Poseidon. And there are little figures just like that running around in the stable. And they are identified by the vase painting specialists as daimons. I don't know, like, what's that fantasy book? Uh, by Philip Pullman. Anybody read those? Well, can we mention <laughs> anyway. that story about Zeus's, um, about Zeus swallowing Athena's mother and that's why he got the headache? We, we could, but we are not going to do that. <laughs> Only because we have more black figure to look at and we are not even halfway through this, this lecture today. <laughs> so, so entrancing is black figure, but yes. There is a very funny backstory. Oh, Greek myth has lots of funny backstories. If you're interested, you should take the Greek mythology class. Um, one of the great painters of the first half of the um, sixth century in the uh, Athenian potter's quarter is Nearchus. He, we know his name. He signs, and you can see it here, Nearchus Agrafsen. Um, we know who this character is because he's labeled. Again, if it wouldn't be for the labels, we wouldn't know who these people are. And he is, can you tell? Who is he? Achilles. Right. He's Achilles. But he, he's partially dressed for battle. He has his corslet on. Um, seems to have forgotten his pants. <sighs> Another way you can tell a hero, I guess. <laughs> um, he is... He is um, Pictured here, this is a the rim of a gigantic cup. It's called Canthros, this kind of cup. It's, it's very huge. It was found on the Athenian Acropolis. It was obviously a dedication. So this was not a cup that was made for, um, that was made for uh, a party. This was a cup that was very carefully and specifically made to dedicate to the deity. This is, again, another indication that of the... Um, the inclusion of craftspeople in the rituals that had formerly been really just for the elite, like, like an, a, a very nice dedication, for example, to a deity. Um, Achilles is quieting his horses. This is a very still scene. Now, if you're a Greek, you would think of the Iliad, which you would know. You would have studied, or you would have heard it. And you would think of the end of Book 19. The end of Book 19, Achilles has just decided that he is going to go and fight. And you have just heard of that decision and the implications of it. And at the end of Book 19, Hera, the queen of the Greek gods, puts voice into the horses of Achilles, and they speak to him. And they say, we shall still keep you safe for this time, Achilles, and yet the day of your death is near. But it is not we who are to blame, but a great god and powerful destiny. It was not because we were slow or because we were careless, but it was that high god, the child of lovely-haired Leto, that would be Apollo, um, who has decreed that you among the champions shall die. not all somber in the artist's quarter in Athens. So uh, lots of the vessels are 
decorated to comport with the spirit for which the vessel was intended. This is a wine cup. And what you have very regularly on wine cups are um, happy satyrs and other folks dancing away. So you see satyrs dancing here um, on this side of this wine cup. And then on the other side of the wine cup, this is a category that <laughs> Greek vase painting artists clearly challenge to come up with clever names to identify characters. So they revert, revert to things like daimon. Call padded dancers. These are called padded dancers because they look like they've got some kind of little pillow attached to their butt so that maybe after they dance and they drink too much and they fall down, they won't get hurt and it will just be all jolly and they will just fall down, ha, 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 <laughs> on, their, on, their, on their rear end. You also see, this is sort of cute, um, actually these are two different cups, not the same cup because they have two different rim motifs. Um, you see on this rim motif, blob rosettes that have been picked up by, uh, um, by, by the attic painters. Um, one of the most prolific and most fun of the artists in the artist quarter by the middle of the 5th century um, is this fellow, the Amasis painter. I will tell you how he gets his name, and then we will start talking about him next time. We have eight vases that are all signed by somebody named Amasis, who made the vases. So Amasis was a potter. Amasis mepoyasen. Amasis made me. And on all eight of those vases, the same hand, the same artist, is identified as the painter. For various reasons, uh, scholars don't think that the painter and the potter were the same person. Sometimes painter and potter are the same person, but, not, but usually not. And so uh, this guy is called the Amasis painter, meaning he's the painter who paints on the pots that are potted by a mesis. All right, we'll start with the Amasis painter next time.